because you are holy. Mm. And we pray that our worship would honor you. And we thank you for what lies ahead. Mm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can see it. That was a good start to a morning, wasn't it? <laughs> good morning, everyone. On behalf of the executive um, of the Baptist Women of the Midwestern Association, and on behalf of the Frank Street Baptist Church, I want to welcome each and every one of you here today. We have a whole morning planned, and I know that you are anticipating what Mary has to say to us. We're also looking forward to spending time together um, we do that, we've already done some of that downstairs, and over lunch is another time of fellowship, so we're looking forward to that. Now before, most of you have already um, discovered where the washrooms are, but just in case, when you go downstairs and are facing the counter, it's, they're on the right-hand side, and there are two, and one is for uh, a wheelchair accessible. And the second thing I want to mention to you is for those who are gluten intolerant, there is a, a meal that will look after that, but you have to ask when you get to the serving. They're going to serve you today and have your plates ready for you. Just tell them you're gluten intolerant and they'll give you what, what you need. So before we start, um, I want to take the time to remember a very special lady. Many of you knew Marilyn Ringle who went to the First Baptist Church in Owen Sound. In August 11th, 1924, she passed away. <clears throat> and we want to recognize her, particularly um, from, from the Baptist women, because we know she loved her church and she loved her church family. She was kind, she was a caring person, and she had a good sense of humor. But she used her gifts in service to the Lord. She was on the executive of the Baptist Women and Our Association from January 2011 to 2020. She started as the divisional treasurer and moved on to the position of treasurer. And she held that position for six of the 10 years she was on the executive. So she always served as treasurer. So at, for this moment, what we want to do is just recognize Marilyn's service on the executive and we grieve along with her and her family. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me, please? Father, we come into your presence this morning in awe, for you are an awesome God. You reveal yourself to us in your word. In the Psalms we read, of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax like old, like a garment, as a vesture who shall, you shall change them, and they will be changed, but thou art the same and thy years shall have no end. Our Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty, and his throne is secure. And this morning, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit move freely among us. Let this, be, this time together be a time for introspection and refreshment for each woman here. Thank you for your son. For those who have confessed Christ as our Lord and Savior belong to you. We are a new creation through the indwelling <coughs> excuse me, of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has redeemed us from the sin that leads to death and has given us abundant life. Use us, Father, as we step out in faith to share with others the good news. We pray for more faith and more commitment to your great commission. Lord, we thank you for the voices lifted up in praise today, for you are worthy of our worship. Anoint Mary as she shares with us what you have placed in her heart. May each segment of our time together be God-centered and be a blessing to you. Let the conversation be uplifting, 
and then let us bless each other. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have a couple of spots on our executive that need to be filled. Now, Gloria Morris from Glendale Baptist Church, she will be our new president. Um, and Linda Jansen of Lamas Baptist Church has taken over the ministry link position. And thanks to both of these ladies. And we thank Nancy Natchez. Nancy has held the position of president for five years and has done a fantastic job. So thank you so much, Nancy. We are in need of a vice president and an assistant ministry link. I can say, or I think I can say that we all love being on the executive and helping to plan the rallies. And we enjoy the worship and the fellowship with the other members. They are great ladies to work with. We've been meeting on Zoom since COVID. Not as much traveling, but we do like to get together for a meeting as well, just to, just to see each other and and uh, meet. We ask you to pray about this, and if you feel you could help us out in any way, please do. The um, only stipulation is that um, you need to be a member of a church in Midwestern Association. That is, is something that is in our Constitution. <coughs> we meet approximately four times per year, including our fall rally, unless something comes up that needs to be dealt with. If you feel you could help us any way by joining the executive, please get in touch with Nancy, any executive member, or your ladies' association rep in your church. We need to fill these positions, and we need some new ideas. And, and uh, So please fill out your survey forms when you receive them from Secretary Jan. And please continue to keep the executive and all the ladies in the association in prayer. We continue to pray for you. We continue to pray for you. And after the service today, or after lunch or around lunchtime, um, there will be a prayer room available if you would like to have prayer uh, with one of our executive members. And uh, uh, we invite you to do this. Thank you. But not so with you, rather let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. The focus here is on humility and service, key components of leadership in the New Testament. Romans 12, 8. The one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This verse points out the various ways in which a leader should act, highlighting zeal, generosity, and cheerfulness. Matthew 20, 26 to 27. It shall be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. This verse reiterates the service-oriented nature of leadership, where greatness is achieved through serving others. Proverbs 16, 12, it is an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Righteousness is portrayed as the foundation of truth, true leadership, emphasizing the abhorrence 
of sin in a leader's life. And Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Here, the emphasis is on humility and selflessness, core principles for any leader aspiring to follow Jesus' example. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here today. I pray that you bless these ladies, give them your guidance and wisdom as they serve. I pray that you meet their needs, that they would have energy and your inspiration, as well feel joy in their service. I pray that you have your hand of protection on these ladies and their families. Thank you for how you're working in their lives, and I pray that you would work through them. In your precious holy name, amen.
We are being blessed with sunshine. And I think a lot of you coming in this morning were blessed with the rainbow. So, even though it's dark and cloudy, God is always with us. So we're going to uh, have the roll call for the churches. And as in the past, we would like one representative from each church stand up and say what your new projects or old projects are uh, happening at your church. And just so that we're all together and can support each other. So the first one I have is Chesley Baptist Church. I think, is there a microphone that we can... All right. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, this is loud. So we continue to do some fundraisers, teddy bear motorcycle run. Um, we had a music revival night. We've got a couple of them this year. Uh, we also have the back to school bash. Um, and 55 children received backpacks. We continue to do Kids Club. It's an outreach on Saturday mornings where kids can learn about God. Maybe they don't go to church. And uh, Bible studies continue Monday nights for men and women. And we have a new um, youth drop-in center, which is kind of an outreach for the youth. We um, it's just a place to drop in and hang out with some friends, but it's a way to get them into the church. Right now, media is a platform that we're using. It has been used for some sermons, uh, and it's also been used for some Bible studies. And um, you probably all know uh, Dean Bender has retired, so... Um, yes, the community meal continues, and we, we serve like 150 people a week, and I'm sure it'll increase in the winter, and yeah, that's, that's us, that's what we're doing. <laughs> That's interesting. It's always good to try and get the youth into our churches. Uh, I think our church will have something to say about that as well. When they stand up, that's the only sound. Um, so the next one <coughs> is Durham Baptist Church. Would you please stand? luncheon and event in April. We've had two missionary Sundays. Uh, we celebrate our 171st anniversary at Durham Baptist in September. We had our corn roast again and we have a secret sister exchange and revealing in November, usually November or December. We've had a couple of missionary Sundays as well. Hey, thank you. Glamis Baptist Church. <clears throat> um, if anybody had been to Glamis Baptist Church in the last, uh, let's say before um, last June, um, and tried to go uh, you would have seen these steps that were crumbling, and they were just terrible. People were getting to the place we were scared to go in. So we did a brand new uh, uh, approach to our church. So it was new steps, new landscaping. It's great. Come and see it sometime. It looks great. Um, yeah, the Lord's saying you need to be good stewards with your money, but now it's the time to spend it. So we did. <laughs> and, um, 
What else? We had our 150th anniversary. We had uh, a wonderful group there from uh, the Amish community that um, just astounded us with their music. And um, about 250, I think, all of you all together attended. It was a good night. So, um, and we give thanks for that, 150 years. And uh, we have a women's Bible study Saturday mornings, which we do on Zoom right now. Um, and maybe we'll get back together in person one of these days, but now that it's coming winter, we'll probably still stay on Zoom. <laughs> and we just give thanks to the Lord for all that he does for us all the time. He's good all the time. Lynn Health Center, Baptist oh, Church. Sorry, sorry I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know that there was a comment made to the rainbow. We saw the rainbow as we were driving up this morning. Double rainbow. But my thought is, not my thought, this is the rainbow belongs to the Lord. Yes. <laughs> the rainbow does not belong to anyone else. Right. Thank you. <laughs> the Nail Center. <laughs> I forgot to be kind of prepared for this, so I might be a little jambled. But that's okay. So I have the Nail Baptist, Center Baptist Church. Um, we're a little country church. Um, yeah, we have junior church happening. We have youth group happening. Um, our youth group doubled in size, so we're about eight now. So that's <laughs> exciting. I help out with the youth group. Um, we have a few Bible studies on the go. Um, and a lot of um, working just in getting to know our neighbors in our community. Um, and trying to do a few events here and there um, just to, to get to know our neighbors. Great. Thank you. This will first stop this church. <laughs> I don't think all of Listow was standing. <laughs> yeah, we are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, just the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're surprised. I, did, I didn't know we were going to do this, but um, we need to say something. Um, I guess big news in our church is a year ago we um, welcomed Matt and Alyssa Sampson as, mm -hmm. as our pastor and after being without one for a while we're very excited to have him there. Um, things that go on, we have a ladies Bible study that meets in person on a Tuesday afternoon and then very recently just started a Monday evening one all online and so that's a, a new adventure to see how that will work out and include some different people. Um, we've continued on with PA fun days for our community, so when the kids are off school, we um, welcome them in to spend a day more or less using the VBS program that lasts throughout the year, one day at a time, and uh, that's a bit of an outreach, and we're thrilled about that. Um, this summer, we worked through Thrive Bible Studies with the idea of just evaluating where we are as a church and where does God want us to go. New Set Baptist Church. meets at two different times to accommodate different people's schedules, Monday evening and Tuesday morning. And we have a mentoring group on Wednesday morning, men's Bible study Thursday evening. And uh, Thursday afternoon we have a girls club where we're doing, um, looking at a book about how to make choices and uh, reading scriptures and we have homework. And then we're learning some full body movement and some stretches and uh, we're learning knitting. And then um, we continue to do the midweek children's program called um, Bedtime Bible Stories. 
and it's been growing uh, as the kids age. They they keep on coming, and it's uh, at a couple's house um, from our church, and we also continue to do the Operation Christmas Child, and the ladies have started the. Um, we had soups, a soup song. I don't know exactly what we call it. <laughs> um, a while back. And uh, they started that again. There was some requests from the community to do that again. So at this point in time, it's one Thursday a month that they'll be providing a meal to whomever wishes to come. And then two Sunday evenings a month, um, we're hosting a dinner within our church for fellowship and time to meet and greet. And whoever also wants to come to that can as well. Did I miss any? <laughs> well, back there, Bible Club was... It's like BBS, but we just call it something different because it's all outdoors, and that was in the summer. And I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're continuing to um, grow and meet and fellowship together, too, and it's encouraging to see where God will lead us next. Okay. Thank you. First Baptist Church on the sound. We have a men's breakfast. <laughs> we have a men's breakfast that they're meeting actually this morning. They meet every every the last Saturday of every month. We have a women's um, group that meets the last Monday every month. Basically, we usually bring our lunch and eat at the church. But because of the women's shelter, we do something different every month. Um, we've collected stuff for the women's shelter. This month, we did um, craft stuff for the mental health people. And then we're doing Christmas bags for the shut-ins. We have a youth group, which is surprising to us because we've never had a youth group. We have a, had a family that moved here from India with two teenage girls. And because of them going to school, they actually bring, they bring their friends to church. And on Sunday, they actually did part of the service. It was so nice to have that happen. We have Bible studies. We have on Tuesday night, Keith does a Zoom. And um, on Thursday afternoon, we're almost out doing our, our room sometimes. We're in the parlor and we have usually up to 12 or 15 people, so that's really good. Um, we have the BME Church that meets in our church right now because their building is contaminated and they have to redo it, which is really nice because um, their pastor preaches on the last month, the last Sunday of the month, and we have a Sunday um, potluck that day too, so, which we never did before. So um, I think we're doing okay right now. Sometimes I don't think we do very much, but <laughs> this year and we're really excited about having the youth. Timberton Baptist Church. Good morning. Good morning. Greetings from Timberton, Ontario. Um, my name's Lisa, and this is Deb. Um, we have been working with um, the CDOQ doing the revitalization program, and uh, we've been doing that. Well, we're in a we're in our first year, but we did do a, a preliminary program with uh, Sid Lati, and um, so that's going well. Uh, we have a men's outreach on Wednesday mornings, and that's led by Deb's husband, Don. And um, we have about eight men from the community that are attending on average. Uh, we celebrated our 169th anniversary on June 2nd. -ish. And, uh, yeah. The first Sunday of June. Yes, that's right. Okay, and then um, just recently we had the Tiverton Fall Fair and we participated in the worship service with uh, two other churches. 
in our community. Uh, Don gave the message. Uh, we um, are also doing outreaches. Uh, they consist of Remembrance Day service. We're providing a lunch this year on November 11th. Um, we have Bible study on Wednesday nights. Uh, we have another outreach. We have a women's Christmas event happening on Saturday, November the 23rd in the morning, <coughs> excuse me, including lunch. Uh, we are, have planned a women's monthly um, UFO night where you bring your um, unidentified uh, Unfinished project, yes. <laughs> and then we're all going to just like hang out and eat treats and do whatever. <laughs> so many unfinished projects. This is going to have to go on for years. Yeah. <laughs> so we're starting on in December and uh, hopefully going until April. So we'll meet once a month for that. And then um, we have the Christmas tree lighting in Tiverton. So um, I organized that and then Deb generally does the cookies and serves the apple cider and the hot chocolate. And um, that's just a great event where we have up to 80 people come out, family and families and and, uh, and people of all ages really. And uh, Santa comes, likes the tree, and um, we enjoy the treats provided by our church. And uh, what was that? Mm, yeah. Pretty cool trip for yeah. five people. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, back or er, wired to Frank Street Baptist Church. We also do a barbecue and cookie walk in the summer, and both of them are popular. So far this year, we have filled 50 shoe boxes with the help of our church family. We've been collecting items in this, since the spring with a new list of items for each month. The last month is for donations for postage and the greatest journey. This idea has been very successful, and we plan to do it again next year. We make greeting cards for the shut-ins and those in the nursing homes. We provide snacks for coffee time after church and collect items for the food bank in Wharton. Several of our ladies help make free lunches for those in need at the greenhouse in Wharton on a weekly basis. The Lord has truly blessed us as we work to spread the gospel in our community and beyond. Thank you. Uh, the following churches uh, in our association were absent. Kim Carden Baptist Church, Meaford Baptist Church, Monk Baptist Church, Mount Forest Baptist Church. I believe that's it. So we'll just uh, pray for God's blessing upon those these churches and hope we'll see them next year. Thank you. Some of the uh, rallies on the um, 
information forms that uh, Jan gives out just uh, to kind of raise our rallies, um, one of the things that we've noticed is that uh, pretty well everybody asks for prayer for our churches. So we're going to pray for, we're going to pray for our, our churches today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you are our God and creator, Lord. You are a refuge in good and in bad times. We praise you and honor you. Thank you for the undying love and the many blessings that you give us. We pray for the women in our association who are suffering from illness, bereavement, or may need spiritual encouragement. We pray that, we'll, that they will become closer to you and use their talents to further your kingdom. All the folks in your churches, Lord, continue to seek your wisdom. Please guide us and give us strength. Grant us the humility to always seek your will in all that we do and say. We thank you for your gift of the church, through which you spread your love, mercy, and truth throughout the world. Your church is not just a building, Lord, but a living body of believers united in Christ. We ask, Lord, that through you, our pastors and church leaders, our Baptist Association women and officers, and the CBWOQ leaders will remain strong in their faith as you would have them do. And please guide and direct them as they fulfill their duties as our leaders. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son Jesus into the world to save us from our sins. We thank you for your precious gift of salvation. We pray these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, hello everybody. <clears throat> it is such a great privilege for me to introduce our guest speaker. I have known Mary McCartney for a long time. Um, I won't say how long because that'll show how old we really are. Um, anyway, uh, it's, it's just uh, such a joy to have her here today with us. Um, Mary has done a lot of things in her life. She, has, uh, she was a teacher, uh, she was a, a mom, um, and she was a member of King Carden Baptist Church for over 20 years, served on the board for Camp Hermosa for eight years, five of them as treasurer. Um, and she's also an author. And Mary has written a couple of, at least a couple, more than that, but three, four, whatever, yeah. some books anyway, <laughs> that are uh, quite intriguing. Um, the last book that she has written is called, no, I'm gonna save that till a bit later. Um, she took a trip across Canada all by herself, um, absolutely alone. No, she says, no, nope, not quite alone. She said, first of all, she said, yeah, I went solo. No, I didn't. She said it was a duo because it was me and Jesus. So she took Jesus with her across Canada and has written this book called don't die before you're dead, <laughs> which is intriguing. Anyway, it is just such a great honor to introduce Mary McCartney to you. I'm wondering if people can hear me. I tend to be fairly loud. Having been a teacher, can I stand here? Would that be an issue? Should I have a microphone? I have a lot of difficulty staying put. <laughs> in fact, people ask me where I live, and I tell them my furniture lives in Oakville. <laughs> because I don't tend to be there so much. So, um, what do you think? Is this loud enough for you? No? You'd like a microphone? Can I use the word one? Absolutely. I mean, I could stand up there. Would you like a little puppet or a normal? I could just hold on to it. If I wave it around, somebody's got to tell me that I'm losing it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Is it on? Yep. It's on. 
And now, I might blow you out of the water, so hang on to your seats. I am loud and microphones kind of scare me. How's that? Is that better? Okay, excellent. Thank you for inviting me to come today. God has been, oh, beyond words in my life. It's hard to find the words. And before I even start, I need to share with you, ladies, an experience I had last night. You know, I was just sitting there, and I, I couldn't believe, really, what was going on around me. So I ran away from home with two of my besties. We went to this B&B um, cottage out near Cobacon. Know where that is? Yeah? I drove in from there this morning. Just a fabulous place, a wonderful drive, a lot of rain. I saw a fuzzy rainbow, only one, but I saw it. But my two friends are blessings to me beyond measure. I've been places in Canada, and I've been fortunate enough to travel in Central America, and I could live down there except for my friends and my family. But these two friends are my besties. Now one, her husband prayed for her for like 10 years to accept the Lord. Every morning you go downstairs in the basement, she never knew why until after that he was down there praying for her. My other friend is a seeker. She says she's spiritual, she's a seeker. And it's in God's timing, not mine. I'm not the orchestrator of her faith, but I am called to be ever present in me, to speak truth, and not shy away from things that might be a little bit uncomfortable. But I've known these two ladies 20 some years. And I know, I said, God's timing. I get impatient, and he and I have words about it. <laughs> Come on, what's, what's taking you so long, right? But it doesn't matter. But the reason I was so surprised last night is we ended up in this lovely B&B that I'd almost give my right arm to live in. It was just incredible. Big TV over this beautiful brick fireplace. And so my friend, the spiritual gal, is a whiz with remote controls and all this technological stuff. I used to teach computers in the early 90s. Now I need a 12 year old to fix my phone. <laughs> Everything's changed so much, but Sue is great. And next thing you know, we're flipping through YouTube videos. She loves country western music. No surprise. A lot of it's pretty decent, nice beat, or just chit chatting. But what happened next could only have been of the Lord because suddenly she's tuning in all of these, for lack of a better word, worship songs, choruses, quartets, singing hallelujah, all the different groups. Some of our well-known singers that have chosen to record some worship songs. And there's a group in particular that we were watching, and they were a band playing in the round. They were singing, all these people all around them. And the songs were incredible, and the hands all up, and my friend says, I don't know why churches don't have that kind of music. She said, I would go there. And yet, you know, music is something that's really difficult in a lot of places and it's balance. As an English teacher in school, trying to find ways of doing things to accommodate, I always found balance to be the hardest word because it is balance that matters. But I'm sitting there in awe watching God work. And the lyrics are on the YouTube screen and there's no misunderstanding what the message is. And I know my friend is a thinker, and she's been watching these because she just do 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 and found them. Oh, have you heard this? Have you heard that? So I had to share that with you today, ladies, because 
like if you're like me, sometimes we don't really know where things are going. And I don't think I don't think I'm supposed to know. Can you imagine me walking around with this big head? Know what I did today? That was all me. No, God knows that it's his time we do our thing, believe it to God. So I I was impressed with sitting there with these two ladies on a Friday night, gone out to dinner. We could have played games, we could have done all kinds of things. Anyway, I hope that's an encouragement for you this morning because it sure was for me last night. Anyway, thank you for letting me share that with you. God has been very, very good to me. Now, the book I wrote came about in about 2019, I guess it was. The cover of it, and it's on your program, thank you very much, whoever did that, and it says, life is not your average road trip. How many of you have been on a road trip, gone on vacation, packed and planned and sorted and did everything you're supposed to do? And most times, because there's a lot of money involved, you gotta get to the airport on time, you gotta weigh your luggage, so you're limited on what you can carry or pay more. You've got a hotel booking that's reserved for you. So there's certain things that you're absolutely 100% committed to. But in life, no matter what we tend to do, gets kind of messy sometimes, right? Anybody had a little bit of a messy spot in their, in their, in their life? <laughs> if you haven't, I can share. I've had more than my share. When I was about six, and my older sister was going on eight. Our mother decided she really didn't want us anymore because the guy she wanted to go out with or marry eventually didn't want somebody else's kids. So my older sister was by one father, I was by another. So my older sister was adopted by a brother of her, of our mother's. So she stayed in the family and knew everybody. And I was put in foster care for a year. Then I was adopted by seniors by age then for having children. Things were different back then. People were having children earlier. If my mother had been my birth mother, she would have been 34. My dad would have been in his 40s, which by today's standards is nothing. But back then, it was not common. Both my parents were only children and had no relatives in Canada. It was not a good match. I mean, I was difficult to say the least, angry perhaps, troubled, rebellious, a handful, maybe more than one. I mean, I've, I've got four sons, and I can imagine that maybe I was more than all of them put together some days. But I decided that I didn't like other people making decisions for me because I didn't like their decisions. I was going to take charge because I knew better. So what did I do? My ultimate wisdom as a grading student, at Christmas time I quit school and got married. I knew better. Two boys, five years, divorce. And as if that wasn't enough, how many of you have learned to practice things? Right? Do you get it right? Well, didn't I go and do the same thing with the same type of guy all over again? And now I call them affectionately my practice marriages. But I married another fellow, had two more sons, and another divorce. However, in the midst of that second marriage, we were in a lot of trouble. And we had, I had, the most incredible mother-in-law, stepmother-in-law, really, who spoke of Jesus for church and how wonderful it was to have the support. She was on her own as well. And through her encouragement, my then husband and I went to the church and with counseling and understanding. I was raised in Anglican. I already knew God and I missed the lessons about Jesus. I don't know what I was doing, not listening. So my then husband and I, we accepted the Lord and immediately made plans to change our life. We were DJs, late nights, 
Out went the bar. No more drinking. Quit smoking. I gotta tell you how I quit smoking. I made a statement that no one should ever make. I said, God, how come you can get me to stop biting my nails, but you can't get me to stop smoking? <laughs> the very next cigarette I had, I thought I was gonna die. I'm sure I turned green. I felt like my head grew 10 times its size. I was in, uh, I had a client that I was doing uh, their books for. And I was sitting in the kitchen during the books and I couldn't even think. My brain got so rattled, I felt so nauseous. I haven't had a cigarette to this day. I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, there are people who've been smoking a, a little while and they quit. And they go to a party and smoke some more. I hear God in the back of my head and you know what he's saying? Oh, oh, oh Mary. I helped you the, the first time. You do this, you're on your own. And I've, I've not had a cigarette since, thankfully. And there's a reason I'll say that, tell you that in a minute. But I thought God was in control, God was in charge. I expected perfection. We were saved. I expected no problems in my life because we gave our lives to Jesus. Well, it turns out that my then husband thought that it wasn't fun going to church as often as we did. The kids were finding it difficult because they were older and they were just kind of thrown in with kids who had been Christians their whole lives. So they felt lost. So on 24th of May weekend, or 24th of May weekend, my then husband decided that he had had enough of all of us and left gave up his faith, as far as I know. Again, who am I to judge? But he left all of us. And I have to tell you, I felt like Jonah in the whale. If it hadn't been for my kids or my church family, I don't know what would have become of me. Seriously, in, in, in the full transparency, I honestly thought if I could just get drunk at night, maybe I could go to sleep. I wouldn't go to a liquor store and buy anything. I told everybody I'd quit drinking. That would make me a hypocrite. So I didn't drink anything for nine years. And the only time I ended up after nine years is I raised a hand uh, and toast the glass of wine at someone's wedding. But had that liquor, that booze, been in the house, I would have been in a different place today, I'm sure of it. And so part of that message to me was always, God is there before the need. All of that was in place before the crash, if you will. And I know there's a lot of times when things come up and things happen and we think, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, I prayed and prayed and prayed for that man to come back. I even set a place for him at the Christmas table. And God said, Mary, I know you really want a good family life, but this isn't it. And I don't know if you know Garth Brooks, but Garth Brooks sings a song that says some of God's greatest prayers, or some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayer. So, my ex and I never reunited. I would have taken him back up until the minute he said, I do, to the next wife. And I thank God all the time that I wasn't asked to do that. I would have, because I felt that that's what I was supposed to do. So, did I run out and find another man right away? I'm happy to say no, but I did find another man. I went to teacher's college. I went to first university. I was a high school dropout, as I said, right? So I went back to school, became a teacher, went to teacher's college, but it was six years. And my last husband uh, was in a teacher's college. We were classmates for almost a whole year at teacher's college. 
before we got engaged, got married. And we were good, good friends. God gave me a whole new life, and it was like the Lord has restored the years the locusts have eaten. A wonderful man, and we had the opportunity of doing a lot of things together. Because we were teachers, we had our summers off. Don't hate me, okay? I know that's touchy. <laughs> But we both had our summers off, so we decided we're both water people. My husband was a national swim champion for his age group. He loved the water, and I loved the water, so what's the natural thing to do? Go out by a sailboat. Only thing is, neither one of us knew how to sail. <laughs> Have you ever tried to go buy something that you know absolutely nothing about? Like, does it have this? You don't even know what it's called. Or so the salesman tells you, well, it's not one of these, and it's been updated every five years, and you go, well, I don't know what it does. Is five years good? Maybe you're supposed to do it every year. Anyway, we bought a sailboat, we learned to sail. The first day, we went out on the boat. We didn't even know how to put it together. It was like a jigsaw puzzle on the land. And the owners had to put it all together for us. And I took pictures so we could put it back together or take it apart or whatever it was this next. The next day, we had the boat registered in our names and it was time to take it out on the water. It was such a hot, hot, humid day. And my husband, I think, I hope I can say this, I know we have one man in the audience here, but I hope I can say this with three husbands and four sons. I'm a little biased. Men like to tinker with things. Oh. <laughs> is, that a, is that a fair statement? <laughs> and my husband is down below, twisting knobs, flicking switches, sliding things open, pulling drawers open. And I'm up there on top, cooking, <laughs> literally cooking. And I'm in my kindest, sweetest wife's voice saying, if you don't get this boat out of the water, somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. We managed to get the boat out of the water. A couple weeks later, we actually rescued somebody. It was us and another boat. And the lady's in the back of the boat, sir, and she's doing this. I looked at Joe and I said, do you think she's exercising? <laughs> he said, I don't know. Because there is a signal for help. And I'm sure you can figure it out. <laughs> anyway, we looked at each other and thought, well, we'll just kind of pull on over and see what's going on. So we did. And the captain of the boat, which was the woman, says, we have a problem with our engine, we got something stuck in the wet, I call it, and we can't get back into the river. Can you tow us? And my husband says, sure. <laughs> of course he did, right? <laughs> so the man on the other boat says, throw me a line. Joe says, we don't have a line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll throw you ours. And we did, we took them into, into the river. But I said, do you think they would have let us help them if they really knew who we were? <laughs> anyway, God really allowed my husband and I to really put many years of life together in a short period of time. He's been gone seven years. He ended up with a neurological disease that by the time he, just as he passes, cannot even swallow water or eat. Mm -hmm. Completely paralyzed, trapped within his body. Mm -hmm. Very young. Of course, you have to know that because I'm very young, right? <laughs> but the Lord gave us so much time together that I feel a lot of people put off until later. Oh, well, let's wait until we have nothing else to do, and then we'll 
hold hands and walk on the beach. Or we'll take a trip or we'll go play golf together. Don't die before you're dead is all about get out of the house, do something. Doesn't matter what it is. Linda has told you, and I'm sure you see from the picture there, I got myself a little, it used to be a little belt telephone cargo van, you know those little white squat box things with their ladders on the top? Yeah, I bought me one of those, because I could drive it. I don't like to have a big vehicle because I just don't think my driving skills are as good as they should be. I have friends who drive school buses and I take them all the time. Somebody said to me, you like driving, Mary, you should be a transport trucker driver. <laughs> I said, if I could just go in a straight line, it'd be perfect. <laughs> I'd meet somebody in the cab. You know, we get to the outskirts of town, you drive. Get on the other side, I'll drive in straight highways. But I got this little cargo van. And one of my sons converted into a little camper that's Mary's size. I'm five foot three, and so is my bed. <laughs> and my bed is a little wider than me. And I've got cabinets in there, and a little sink. And of course, everybody wants to know, do I have a bathroom? And then I explain to them in this most discreet manner possible, no. <laughs> the distance between the sofa, the sofa opens to a bed, the distance between the sofa and the cabinet is 11 inches. <laughs> no. But I traveled, so in 2021 when I bought it, we were on lockdown. Do you remember that? Well, maybe most people were in lockdown. I traveled all over Ontario. I wasn't interested in museums and art shops and boutiques and all that, so that's just not, but parking by a lake. Let me see the majesty of, of Canada and God's wonders and the waterfalls. So I drove all over Ontario in 2021 when we were supposed to be at home. I went all the way up to the Manitoba border, around Quebec. Wasn't supposed to go to Quebec, but the bridge that you have to use to do the turnaround wasn't on the border. I had to go to Quebec and get over on the other side and come back. Then in 2022, I went to uh, Vancouver Island. Now, I have four sons. I'm a widow. And my boys are pretty used to me by now, but they do tend to check in and see what I'm up to. Because I say things like, I don't like going to campsites. I don't want to pay to sleep. If I had to pay all of that expenses, I probably wouldn't have been able to go. So my little camper man, if I couldn't stay in a Walmart parking lot with a bunch of other campers, I slept on the street. I would just pull in front of somebody's house, whole line of cars on the street, and I'd just pull in and be one of them. So their old lady mother, and they'll say to their friends, you know what my mother does? I sleep on the streets. Now the funny thing about that is I'm afraid of the dark. I told you about my being given it up into foster care. Well, I'm so old that they didn't have indoor plumbing. So we had to use the outhouse. And I'm afraid of the dark. And so here I am in my camper parked at the side of the road, in my own camper all by myself, in the dark. I climb in before it gets dark and I don't come out till morning. And I'm reading mystery stories. <laughs> I know, it's a little strange, but I was not alone. I think I've actually seen God's hands come down from heaven and put his hands to stop my car before a track almost ran me over. God's always with me. And it's the only place I can really sing, and I apologize for those who are sitting close to me for the hand sings, but I can't help myself, I love to sing. But I'm not allowed to most places, but in my own vehicle, 
driving down the road, I don't listen to the radio. I just sing my heart out all the praise songs I can remember. And I raise my hand. It took me a long time to learn to do that. And the people driving by me think I'm the friendliest driver on the road. <laughs> and I'll believe it. I can say goodbye. <laughs> but I know that God was with me every step of the way. So I went out to BC. My first day on the island, I went into Qualicum Beach. Went and put my toes in the water there. Came back up and tripped over the sidewalk and fell on my face. I should fell on my face. And there was a group of people there right beside me, and not one of them turned around. So I said, <laughs> a little bit louder. <laughs> and they turned around. Oh, are you all right? And I had mud all over my arm, down my leg. And some young fellow means well says, oh, I have a band aid. <laughs> He did. He went and got it for me. <laughs> I met the greatest people on my travels. And one of the things that I did, and maybe it's something you'd like to think about, I don't have a lot of pictures of my husband and I together. You know, it's always one or the other doing something or other. So I made it my mission to ask mostly senior couples if I saw them. If I could take a picture of the two of them together, and I would tell them why. Some people thought it was Looney Tunes and was like steal their camera. But a lot of people said, sure. And I met this man, he was probably in the early 30s with his wife and a two-year-old. And they were in Sault Ste. Marie. We were in Sault Ste. Marie, and there was like an 80-foot statue of a musky up there. And they were trying to take a picture of it. So I asked if I could do that for them. Well, I've been in touch with them, and that's been like three years now. And I now buy a blog, a blog from his website. And his little boy, he's sending me pictures of this little guy going on. But God put people in my place. Because some people think, wow, that's really brave out there running around by yourself. But you know, there's a sense of loneliness to that. You're standing there looking at God's wonder. You look at this, this waterfall. And it's so magnificent. And you want to just put somebody and go, look at that. Did you see that? Isn't that awesome? And there's nobody there. And the camera does not do it really the justice of these beautiful places. I was so happy that I got to drive across Canada. When my second husband left, I didn't drive. I was afraid. And after he left, I looked at those four boys and I said, I'm not staying home the rest of my life. And I got out there and started driving. First thing I did is I piled all the kids into the car and I drove them all to camp, our church camp down in Pembroke. But God, if ever there was a time to be behind the wheel with me, it's got to be taking kids to church camp. <laughs> and he did. But now I really love to drive and I met some incredible people. I went to Newfoundland this past summer. But I should back up a little bit. Two years ago, I did the East Coast. And as I'm coming back, I'm heading towards Cornwall to head to the East Coast. And my oldest son, who I live with, calls me. He's tripped over the dog and fractured his hip. He's 50 at the time. They're saying, does he need a hip replacement? Well, at 50, he didn't want to do that. So I'm such a good I'm such a modest, humble, good mom. So I left my trip and went home, and I drove that kid of mine every day to work for, around work for two months. He was an estimator for a tree company. So he'd throw his crutches in the car, hop in, and I'd drive from house to house to all, to all his estimates for two months. And we bonded. And this was the one kid of all of them that we never thought the two of us would survive. <laughs> and now it's a big joke in the family that he's the one that's looking after me. But he said his time is almost up and he'll pass me on to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't get to do the East Coast then. So what am I going to do? Okay. Last summer, two weeks before I launched to go to the East Coast, my trip, 
Now, ladies, this is a public service announcement. I don't know whether this is something you're aware of. I, at the beginning of May, I had very serious throat pain that lasted maybe about 10 minutes. I was speaking at an event, and the gal who was introduced to me, she turned to me and she said, are you okay? And I went, mm, not really. I was in a lot of pain. It was all in my throat, and it felt like there was somebody blowing up a basketball in, a, in my throat, pressure all around. And it came and it went. I got up and I did my presentation. I was good. The next morning, I was okay. And then a couple of weeks later, I had a hit and miss, nothing serious. But I thought, oh, I better go and get this checked. So I went to the walk-in clinic. And they did the EKG, ECG, or whatever that stuff is, and said, okay, I guess we'll send you to an electrocardiogram person or whatever. Everything seems to be fine. He gave me a prescription for nitroglycerin tablets. Mm hmm Anybody surprised? Yep. Everybody knows what nitroglycerin is? I couldn't get any. There was none in Oakville. The pharmacies didn't have any. The hospital general pharmacy didn't have any. So I went back to the clinic and I said, I don't have any. So he gave me another little prescription. They didn't have any of that either. That was on Friday. And the Friday night, I'm lying in bed, and it's like oh, blowing up in my throat. <laughs> I'm lying there and I'm thinking, oh, I should call an ambulance. Oh, my son would be so angry with me. Oh, but I should go downstairs and wake him up. I don't want to do that. So I let it pass. And the next day, I went to a family barbecue with my bestie friends, the girls I went with this weekend, and had a great time with them. And as I'm coming home, I'm thinking, oh, that's not too smart. Something happens to me, and I run everybody off the road. So I went to the hospital Saturday night. I stayed in a merge overnight. Sunday, they said, we're going to send you to the other hospital for an angiogram. Well, they sent me through the angiogram. Now, I had been back from Guatemala for two months where I walked all over everywhere and went parasailing. And I'm lying on this slab of whatever in the operating room, and they're showing me my heart. And they said, I had three arteries, 95% blocked. 190% blocked. And I looked at them and I went, do you know who I am? <laughs> I, that's not possible. I, I never sit. I'm healthy. I don't smoke. I drink once every eight months, ten months. And they said, no, you've got cardiovascular disease that's probably hereditary. And within the hour, I was in emergency surgery having quadruple bypass a year ago. And then I got grounded and couldn't drive for six weeks. And the reason I'm sharing that with you is because every place I go and I've said that, women don't know that that's how it, it had presented itself. We know it's different for women. How many of you have heard about a seriously sore throat or pressure? You have? Good for you. You're, you're the only one I've met so far. I had no idea. I, I would have had the bottle tongues. I thought I had indigestion. I don't have the best diet. I like to eat the things I shouldn't. But uh, anyway, so last year, I couldn't go east. And I am so thankful that I'm here. I could have died and I wouldn't have drunk it. <laughs> it was that fast. And you know, God healed me so well. Even my, I went to see my surgeon, and he went, wow, you've done really, really well. Now get out of my office, and I don't want to see you again. So I went and did my trip this year. But every day, every day I see God's hand in my life. Now, of course, the question that comes to me, now I don't know how you'd feel. Most of us are like, wow, I am so grateful. My question now is, Okay, God, you could have taken me home. My house isn't ready, obviously. He doesn't want me there yet. 
what's he wanting to do? And so I thought about that last night when we watched those YouTube videos with my friends and talking about what the words meant and about, you know, churches and music and all these young people being attracted to all that music. I don't really know what God has in store for me, and that's probably a good thing. Because then I might argue with him. I was talking to a fellow the other day. Um, he's interested in buying my van. My van is called Benny, by the way. If you look at the picture, it's not like that. It's just a little white cargo van. But I called it Benny. My mother-in-law, my last mother-in-law, always called me Benny. But we never knew why. So sometimes we'd be out, and my husband would come over, and we'd talk, I'd talk to his friends at home, and say, well, Betty, it's time to go home. And these people would say, oh, I'm sorry, I thought your name was Mary. <laughs> How well it is, but no, he's just being smart. So this fellow I was talking to is a man of faith. And the conversation, he called me for a quick minute of conversation about my van, and we talked about God's work in other countries. Uh, he's, he works in the mission fields in Guatemala. Fascinating, he's a singer-songwriter. I don't know what all he's singing or doing, but an incredible conversation. And we were talking about, how do you know what God has planned for you? And I told him that I feel that we lost the art of silence. We don't have quiet anymore to hear God's still voice. And we're still hunting and saying, okay, where, where can we find God's plan for us? Well, obviously it's through prayer. And one of the things I got to do in my van all by myself was to pray a lot. And one of the things that I don't know about you, do you ever wake up in the middle of the night, can't get back to sleep? <laughs> what do you do? <coughs> Anybody have any suggestions? What do you do when you can't sleep? You pray. Do you kind of blame God? I do. Well, God, you woke me up. Who am I supposed to pray for? <laughs> I figure he woke me up. So I start praying. I go through whatever. Next thing you know, I'm, it's morning. So I figure I probably prayed for whoever was at Grace Meeting in need at the time. But I had a lot of opportunity to pray. One of my trips in my van, You've heard the Amber Alert for Lost Kids. Some people are really annoyed about that. I don't understand their thinking. So I'm sitting in my van in a little place called Bell River down near Windsor. Have you heard of it? Beautiful little place. Oh, of course, I think everything is beautiful. And we have this torrential storm going on, and I just pulled to the side of the road. And I was sitting right there, yeah, and the Amber Alert goes off. Well, I know I'm not going to find a child out there, because I'm not out there. I can't help, but I can pray. So I pick up my phone thinking, we pray when we're informed. I want to know what's going on. And I open up my phone, and it's a tornado alert in my area. And I open up the curtain. I have a curtain behind my seat, so it leaves dark and I open it up. I can't see out the front window. The rain is so torrential. I've <coughs> kind of forgotten where I am because I just parked spontaneously. Here's a spot. Park. I forgot what it looked like out there. Now, anybody know what you're supposed to do in this tornado? What's that? Yeah, where's that? Not in my van, is it? No, I didn't. It went a ditch. I didn't even know whether there was a ditch out there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't want to go throw myself on the ground in the ditch in the dead of night and pouring rain. I have to climb back in this van soaking wet. So I just, I prayed a lot. Prayed for the surroundings and everybody around. So the next morning, I meet up down at the beach with the uh, Parks and Rec cleanup crew. And it's a mess. They got their hands really, really full of all, all this stuff to clean up. And I said, oh, 
were you up in that last night? And you're like, are you crazy? I said, well, you know, I, I, my van was just in there. And I said, well, I kind of was. I said, at that time, you were a camper. You were in that? I said, yeah. But I didn't want to throw myself in a ditch. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. And they said, go to one of those coin-operated car washes. And they had the brick walls. That's the safest place to be. And I thought, two things. Was that? It's too late. That was one of them, absolutely. Well, it would have been helpful if I knew that last night. My second thought was, I didn't know where I was, so I wouldn't know where I was going. So I thought, you know what? A direct line to God in prayer <coughs> always supersedes a car wash. And I've been, like, I've had all kinds of things. I've never had what campers, like, it's amazing how much you, what you learn about other people that are doing this. Like, you know what boondocking is? Boondocking. What is it? it it's going where there is no essential amenities. Absolutely. Yeah, you just pull over and park. Right? <coughs> and that's what I was doing, essentially, was going and boondocking. So in the boondocking world, everybody talks about what happens if you get the knock. <laughs> in the middle of the night, somebody's knocking. This is, it won't be good news. My very first week that I was out camping in Ontario, I went to Sarnia. Do you know where the Blue Water Bridge is? Do you know that all those parking spaces under the bridge belong to the federal government? Well, you do now. <laughs> See, I went parked at the side of the street, and I was very conscientious about following the rules. And so I was reading the bylaws that said when you can park on the street and what time. And I got confused. I thought I had to be off the street by 6 in the morning. So, about quarter to 6, I left where I was parked at the side of the street, and I went to the big parking lot under the bridge. And I got the knock from one of our federal agents. You gotta come out of there. And I, I, I'm amazed the time it changed. So it's kind of like, okay, well, so I threw some clothes on and snuck out of my van. This really attractive lady, a federal agent, standing there full uniform, you can't spend the night there. I said, well, I didn't spend the night, I just arrived. Oh, so anyway, we got talking, she bought some books. Two months later, I met her up in Tokomori. She was on a motorcycle with a bunch of people. They were getting on Tokomori uh, to Chichiman and going somewhere up to uh, Algonquin Parkway. And I went, and I drove up there and had lunch with them and everything. Really nice lady. We are friends on Facebook. She's got two black cats. <laughs> But everybody's afraid of the knock. And I always wondered, like this was daytime, so the theater is not the same. But I didn't know what I would do if I got the knock in the middle of the night. How would I answer that? Hello, what do you want? <laughs> what? What is it you want? I didn't know which voice would get me better off. But I never had to worry about that because I believe that God was always traveling with me. He knew what a coward I was and he didn't stress me out. Figured I had enough probably. But I will tell you, anybody here from the Maritimes? No? Anybody from the West, West Provinces? Yeah, what about? Oh, I was born in BC. stories about the maritime friendliness to be 100%. Uh, okay. I was in Gander, Newfoundland, mm -hmm. parked my van, and I was waiting for other campers. I never stayed at Walmart when there weren't a lot of campers. I didn't want to be the only camper in a big parking lot by myself. Then I would go and park on the street. So I'm sitting there, and this little red car pulls up next to me, and there's a man and a woman in the car. He puts down his window, and he said, is that a 2012? 
I got one just like it at home. We're making it into a camper. I said, oh, that's that. I said, this is Betty. He said, mine's called Homer. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this wonderful chit chat, and then I said, normally I never ever opened up my van in public. And I always went in the driver's seat, waited to see nobody was looking, and I climbed in the back. I never opened it up because I didn't want anybody to know it was my home. But there was nobody behind me, so I said to him, and he had his wife with him, so I wasn't worried. And I said, would you like to see what my son did there? And they said, yeah. So the wife jumps out of the van, out of their car, lickety split, to come and check this all out. Well, bless their hearts, they took me home and gave me apple pie and coffee. <laughs> and I spent the night in their driveway, and at second, 7 o'clock in the morning, had a little knock. Bacon and eggs were on the table. <laughs> Fabulous. That was Thursday. I went to St. John's, and on the way back Tuesday, I asked them if we could meet up again. And we did, and he toured me all over Gander. <laughs> Took me up to the new airport, saw all of them at the memorial um, memorabilia of 9-11, and then he took me out to see the memorial for the silent witnesses, where the military aircraft went down. And just, I'm still writing to him, he's, he's retired, he's a bus driver, he's a photographer, and his wife joins the choir, sings in the choir. But God put people in my life as I traveled because I was lonely. And so, what am I going to do now? I have no desire to travel through the States, and if anybody's American, and it, it's just I don't have a calling to be there. Um, it's big, it's fast. I wanted to see Canada, and I did. And I am so thankful I had the opportunity that I lived to finish it. It would have been awful to do half of Canada and then die. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and that sounds pretty, pretty awful, but it's like, God, I've got things to do here. Of course, now he's giving me things to do, and it's like, okay. I'm blessed with great health in spite of my heart. My cardiologist just said he doesn't want to see me for a year, and he said that I've been reset, like our computers, I've been rebooted. And so now I need to be in service for the Lord. I'm going to pick back up my speaking, probably do some more writing. And I so appreciate you ladies. You laughed in all the right places. Thank you. You made me so fun here. And uh, if you think about it, share with people my story about the, the throat thing. I don't think we know enough about that. I think maybe that's what I'm here for. I'm going to share with a lot of people. And anyway, do share that. And uh, don't die before you're dead. Don't stay at home just waiting. God gave us a wonderful life to live. People that to share it with. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Not everybody wants to live in a four by four foot box for three months. Get that. I'm not out here to recruit solo travelers in a box. But get out and do something. Walk. Talk. Go for coffee. Volunteer. I've done a lot of presentations for volunteer organizations that are so hurting because people, that things have changed. When my mother was a volunteer, like, you're signing up for life. <laughs> and nobody wants to sign up for life anymore. So I have been sharing with the volunteer organizations. Ask them to sign up for a task. Keep it short, simple. Just ask them to do something. No, sign here for life. In blood. You want your firstborn? If it wasn't time, I would have given him my firstborn. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better story. Now he's in here. <laughs> However, get out and do something. Life is uh, such an amazing gift. Go meet, go meet your friends. They're lonely too. Call them on the phone. Our brain needs to be worked as much as our body. We can do solo games, or we can engage in conversation with people. 
And you know what? I realized I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here. You all got out of the house. So congratulations and thank you for being here. And if you've got those people who won't get out of the house, go get them. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Linda says I should tell you about my book. My book is called Don't Die Before You're Dead. Surprise! Um, it's part of my story, the detours, the dead ends, the uh, falling off the cliff stuff. There's also an undated calendar in it, so you can start at any time you get it. It doesn't start in January, you can miss half the year, you put your own date in. Uh, it's got some reflection questions in it. It's got a bit of a journal in it. It's a combination. Come, on, come and have a read through it. I've got some un uh, just some lined journals there, but I've also got um, uh, like a self care diary where you can you know, come have a look see. Thanks, Linda. Sorry, you want that? <laughs> Would you like to write? Well, thanks very much, Mary. <laughs> you have reminded us that God is always with us, that we need to seize the day, that we need to overcome our fears, and to see God in our surroundings. Thank you so much, and uh, God bless you in your travels wherever you are led. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mary. We are going to take up an offering this morning. And before we do that, I want to thank you for being here, for coming to Wyerton. Uh, you know, there's a lot of planning and preparation that goes on to make this day happen, so it's um, we're very glad that you set aside time today to be here. And I hope the music, um, and thank you Wendy and Sherry for the music, it's such a treat for us to have people, live people, um, leading music. But we hope that uh, the music and Mary's message and the fellowship that we have shared and will share during lunch um, we'll prepare you for the winter ahead. <laughs> and we don't know what that's going to be like or what road we're going to get uh, led down. But uh... So just to let you know, half of today's offering goes to the church here in Wyerton. And the other half of today's offering goes to Mary to help her. So Vicki and Jan will take up the offering today, and um, after we have it tabulated, we'll let you know what has been gathered for the day, and um, we thank you for your generosity and for being here today.
Let us ask for God's blessing upon these gifts. Father, we thank you for the lives you have blessed each one of us with. Thank you for the joys of friends and family. And thank you, Lord, for bringing us through difficult losses and disappointments. Thank you for being with us through it all, for you are faithful and present. In your great mercy and expression of love for us, you invite us to live a life abundantly for you. Jesus came that we may have life and have it to the full. We praise you, God, for the gift of faith that you have so graciously blessed us with. We thank you for the gifts that have been given here today in support of others. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon all who have given. May they know your provision and protection. And may these many gifts be an encouragement to the work and ministries of their recipients, to your honor and glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray, praise and thank. Amen. Before we adjourn for lunch, I am going to close by asking for a blessing upon the food and uh, closing with a benediction. So please, please join me in prayer. Lord, the psalmist reminds us that the eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the harvests taken off this land and for those who have prepared the meal for us. May it go to our nourishment and us to your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I'll close with a benediction. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may your peace be in our hearts, your grace be in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our souls. Amen.